Hey, 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 and welcome to Pre-AP Biology. As you listen to these lectures, you need to have a pen and a highlighter so that you can take additional notes on the outlines that you've been provided. Make sure everything that I write down, you write down and try to remember what you're listening to so that tomorrow in class, when we discuss the outline, you'll be able to discuss the outlines with us. Okay, so go ahead and get out the first outline. It should say types of cells and structures, part one. And this first part is a little bit about the cell theory or history. Okay, so the first thing it says is the cell theory, and there's three steps to the cell theory. The first one, cells are considered to be the basic unit of life. So where it says A, go ahead and number that one, because you want to know that's number one to the cell theory. Cells are considered the basic unit of life. And all that means is that cells are the smallest thing that are considered to be alive. So write that out beside it. Cells are the smallest living thing. Cells are the smallest living thing. Good. And the guy who came up with that right here. Henry Dutrichet. Okay, number two, all living organisms are composed of cells. And so everything that is alive is made up of cells. So plants, animals, mushrooms, bacteria, everything that is alive is made up of cells. And so out beside that, I want you to write example, plants, animals, and fungi. Okay, so Theodore Schwann came up with this. It says proposed by Theodore Schwann and Malthus Schleiden, which is right here. Theodore Schwann worked with animals and Schleiden worked with plants. And so oftentimes you'll hear this as the Schleiden and Schwann um, theory. So all living things are composed of cells. So first was cells are the smallest living thing. Second, Cells are, all living things are made up of cells. And then the third one, all cells come from pre-existing cells. And, that, and we know that for sure. Today, 2015, all living cells come from pre-existing living cells. So where do skin cells come from? Well, they came from other skin cells. And so all living cells come from cells. And so those are your three um, parts of the cell theory. So do me a favor, pause your video, and see if you can remember all three parts. Because when you get into class tomorrow, that's the first thing we're going to go over. I want you to know all three parts. Okay, so hopefully you know all those parts. And this is um, emergent properties. So on D, underline that. Emergent properties. And it just says that they're, the cell is working together as one unit. All the little pieces of organelles are working together as one unit. Uh, an open system, it says in E, in their natural settings because there are materials coming into the cell and out of the cell that are helping it function. Okay, the microscope, Robert Hooke. And you probably used a microscope or at least seen one developed by Robert Hooke, and it allows you to see things that are really small. And so... Um, developed a simple lens microscope, kind of like the one in the picture, in 1665. So this guy's dead. Really, really old, huh? Um, it was basically like a magnifying glass. Okay, Antoine von Leeuwenhoek was the next guy, and he developed a compound, which means more than one lens, in 1674. So compound microscope, underline compound. And there's two types of microscopes used today. There is, there's the microscope that he made. The, the light microscope, so on one, underline light microscope, and right out beside it, it uses a light bulb. Uses a light bulb. Because sometimes the light bulbs go out and we have to change them. Uh, 
They, they have a lens to magnify, so just like a magnifying glass with a light that helps you look at a specimen. That's just whatever's on the microscope slide. The resolution, this refers to the distance that two points appear separate. And so if a microscope has two, if you're looking at something that has two little bitty dots really close together, and you can tell that those are two different dots, then it has a higher resolution. If those two dots look like, well, let's try again. Like that, they're touching. If the two dots that are separated look like they're touching, then the resolution is higher. So it says, this term refers to the distance that two points appear as separate points when they're really close together. So you can tell that they're two. Okay, so on the, for an example, two micrometers, now that's this, this little thing right here is a micrometer, is about the best light microscope can offer. That's the best it can get. Okay, the magnification capabilities of most light microscope is a thousand X, and that's how you would write it, a thousand times. You're looking at it a thousand times bigger than what it really is. The benefits of a light microscope is that you can look at living things. So you can actually watch an ant crawl or uh, a bacteria. You could actually watch it move under a light microscope. The disadvantage or the drawback is that they are limited. They can only do this 1,000x. So out beside light microscope, make sure you know the benefit and the disadvantage. So maybe write it out beside there. The benefit is you can see living things, living organisms. The disadvantage is only 1,000x. Okay, with the electron microscope, which is, um, and th there you can kind of see the different sizes. Okay, with an electron microscope, which we'll be looking at, you can see much larger. They can see uh, much, much larger than 1,000x, and they're really expensive. Instead of using a light bulb, hey, guess what electron microscopes use? Electrons. This is easy, right? They use electrons. Uh, to produce an image of the specimen on the computer screen. So you'll actually view it right here on the screen. And I've only had an opportunity to look at one of these um, in college. So they're much more expensive, so they're not as common. We don't have one of these in your high school. Okay, two main types are transmission electron microscope, and they're allowing you to look on the inside, like transmission through. And then scanning is used to view the surface of a specimen. And so here, uh, that's kind of what the inside looks like. Okay, so here's your transmission. And see how it kind of looks um, like you're looking at the inside of it. And then the scanning, it looks like it's 3D almost. So out beside scanning, right 3D view or 3D image. See how that same cilia, that's just little hairs, almost looks 3D. That's pretty, isn't it? Okay. Benefits, uh, these provide you, you they, they allow you to see something really, really small. Um, the drawback would be that they're expensive. And they can't, you can't see living organisms. So you can't see living organisms. You can never see how something moves. But you can see how cool that cilia looks. Okay. The study of cells is called cytology. So by the end of unit one you will be a cytologist. You're going to be a specialist in, in cells by the end of this. There's two types of cells that we'll be talking about really all first semester, and that's prokaryotes, which are cells that don't have a membrane-bound nucleus, and then there's eukaryotes. These organisms would have evolved later, and they're much more complex. And so beside prokaryotes, I want you to... Um, Underline the word bacteria and write in that prokaryotes are simple. Right? And they, they would be primitive, which means that they would be old. They've been on the earth for a long time. Eukaryotes would have evolved, evolved much later, and they 
have a nucleus. So, um, prokaryotes do not have a nucleus. So, do not have a nucleus. And eukaryotes have a nucleus. See, that's the main thing. Uh, eukaryotes, like here, are complex. Out beside eukaryote, right, example, plant, and animal. So example, we're writing in plant and animal. Okay, and then the last thing for tonight's video is surface to volume ratio. And all that is, if you think about uh, surface, that's how big the outside is. And then volume, uh, the volume of something is the whole thing, like how much is inside it. So if you think about a basketball, the orange part on the outside is the surface. And the whole basketball, the air on the inside and the outside, that's the volume. Well, cells need to have a larger volume. Cells, I'm writing that down, so you write that down too. Cells want a larger surface area. I might have said that wrong just then. Surface area. They got to have a big surface area so that they can get food in and waste out. Food in, waste out. So cells can only be so small because they got to have room for all. Look at all those organelles. They have to have lots of organelle room. But they can only be so large because otherwise you wouldn't be able to get enough food in or waste out. And so cells want a larger surface area so they can transport food and waste. All right, that concludes the first lecture. I hope that was helpful.